Thank you, Arthur, my brother. You guys hear me okay? You got the gear on up here, right? Thank you. Thank you again, Arthur, for that word. Uh, in some of my study, I was going to have to phone a friend and buy a vowel on some of those names, but uh, praise the Lord for his word. Let me get my stopwatch going here. Well, good morning, Restoration Church. I'm Don. I'm one of the elders here. It is a great joy for me to be here this morning. And in my time of study, Psalm 122.1 had been on my heart. And it says this, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I, I'm just thrilled every Sunday to, to be a part of this body as we grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And thank you for joining us this morning as well. Well, again, Arthur said it. We've been saying it. Two and a half years. We're now uh, at the end of Romans. Pretty amazing. I really feel like I need to start right back over and just keep after it again. Uh, it is so rich in theology and truth. Uh, and Arthur's going to close us out next week. He'll put the, he'll put the book end on uh, the last four verses. But it has been a great time of study. I, I hope you felt that. We've learned about God's law. We've learned about man's sin. We've learned about God's wrath, his mercy. We've learned how we are not saved by our own righteousness, far from it, but by Christ's atonement for our sins, the application of his righteousness to our account. That's imputation, friends. And we've seen Paul outline how all believers receive this gift of salvation by faith alone. Sola fide, you've probably heard that in the Latin. Theologian and reformer John Calvin says this, he says, Romans is the key to understanding all of Scripture. So you, you will do well to go back and continue to pour through this great book. What a great, great statement that is. Uh, common, commentators say this about Romans. They say it's Paul's magnus opus, more Latin for you there, that means great work. It is his greatest work. It is his greatest achievement uh, by the Spirit. And we've seen that in our time together. So again, I'll encourage you, take some time in your studies and continue to reflect on this great book. Also, we elders, we would love to hear your thoughts on how this book has impacted your life. Please be thinking about that. And then send all your email to Jeremy back there at, at, at Jeremy at RestorationSanford.com. And I'll give you his phone number, too. You can blow his, you can blow his inbox up with texts as well. But, but no, you can, you can email Arthur, too. You know. But we come to chapter 16 now. We, we are at the end, and, we, and we're going to see Paul's working relationships. He mentions by name more than two dozen colleagues and co-workers, and and in this extended passage, we see his great affection that he has for those for whom and with whom he's ministered. We get to see this sincere gratitude that the apostle felt for those who had been such a great help and encouragement to him in life and ministry. And that's, what we, that's our desire here at Restoration Church. We desire to do life and ministry with all of you. So we, we cherish that. So I've titled this sermon, The Loving Bond of Faith, because that's the only way we're going to be able to do it. It's the only way, is faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we'll touch on three points from Paul's text, his commendation, his, his caution, and his compliance to these Roman believers. But before we get going too much further, let me pray, and then we'll get into the text. Father, what a great joy it is to have been in this book since the beginning of Restoration Church. We've seen how it provides a careful explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how this letter has had an enormous impact upon the church universal. Indeed, our church to bring awakening and conversion. So we thank you this morning for the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and we thank you for the work of the ministry. May we serve joyfully and in a Christ-honoring way. It's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Well, you heard the list, and I don't know about you, sometimes when I uh, get through passages of Scripture uh, and I see a big long list of names and genealogies and lineages, I've just... 
I, I flip through it pretty quickly sometimes, I'll, I'll admit it, without much consideration to uh, who those people are and what they mean and, 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 and why they're in Scripture. Don't do that. Don't do that. Lists and genealogies are an important part of the fabric of Scripture and can greatly help you in your comprehension and your study of the biblical text. And our passage this morning, as I said, starts off with a list. And uh, we're going to have a little quiz on some of those names. And maybe we'll have a little Restoration Church spelling bee. Aristobulus. A R. No, we won't do that. We won't do that. But, but, but you see what I mean. And I think about First Chronicles, too. First Chronicles is nine chapters of lineage that I just, I, I admit, I just I went straight to chapter 10. Let me get to the fight. Let me get to the battle. But it, it's, in, it's an important part. And as you heard, we, we began with a list. But this list was Paul's heartfelt greeting to those serving with him in life and ministry. And we are thankful for, for you here today who, who are serving in Restoration Church. Um, and take notice of this, too. This is a diverse group of people, as are we. Men, women, Jews, Gentiles. Workers, writers, wealthy, poor, all who were of great value to Paul. Don't think, beloved, that you're part of a church, that your part in a church does not matter because it does. So we all have a part to play in kingdom work. So join in and stay in. On the drive in here, we come up from Oviedo, we come through 46, up through Geneva. There's a little church on the right side of Geneva, and I, and I drive past it every Sunday. Well, today their sign said this. How are you using your talents? How are you using your talents? Think about that. We want you to use your talents for God's work. All right, let's look at, let's look at point one. Paul starts off, verses one and two, praising Phoebe. I commend you, our sister Phoebe, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church of Sencria, Sencria, that you may welcome her in the Lord, in the way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need f- from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. So Paul introduces this, this woman, Phoebe. Not much is known about her. She's a sister in Christ, certainly. She's called a servant right? So she's serving in the church. And remember, that word servant is, is, is the word diaconan, from which we get our word deacon. That's right. She's a deaconess. And her Christian associations were with this church in Sincrea, right? It's near the port of Corinth. Her office in this church was probably not to teach publicly, no, but she served in a capacity of care, most likely, uh, to the sick, She probably had a ministry of hospitality, even helping with financial oversight. But whatever her role, whatever her role, she was highly regarded in her home congregation. And she's being recognized by Paul to the believers at the Church of Rome. And and check this out. And Paul has entrusted her to carry this letter in its entirety to the Roman church. Think of that his greatest work, this treasure that we've poured through for two and a half years, she is carrying those manuscripts to the church in Rome. Remember, Paul wrote this book from Corinth near the end of his third missionary journey. So he's familiar with Phoebe. He's familiar with Sincrea, and he knows God is using her for ministry. He'll use us too, beloved, if you'll humbly let him. He goes on in verse 2. He says, welcome her, support her in whatever she may need, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. It's interesting that he, he calls her a patron. Historically, a patron was someone who could help financially, right? She, she was a, a woman of resources. She had means to, to provide sponsors, uh, sponsorship or patronage, not only for Paul, but also for others in the church. And she's coming to Rome. So Paul instructs them to welcome her and support her. Now you really are seeing the love of Paul, gracious, generous, commending this woman in the common faith, right? That's what I'm talking about. In the common faith that unifies 
all their lives. It's an amazing scene. Paul goes on through verse 16, continuing his greetings to those with whom he has served and served and labored, calling out their character of the, of the Christian brothers and sisters. Character that's marked by their kingdom-mindedness and their humble service. These were people that were a significant part of his life and ministry. So let me, let me go down. We'll, we'll, we'll go down through uh, 16. And I'll hit some of the highlights as we go, and we'll do a we'll do a name pronunciation quiz again as we go. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. I don't think I've risked my neck for the gospel like they did. What about you? I mean, we've got to think about that. I need to think about that. What are we willing to give up? What are we willing to sacrifice? What are we willing to risk for the cause of Christ? We have it pretty good in this country, so we're, we're not being thrown in jail and, and persecuted. It is a tough question, though. And it makes me think of Esther chapter 4. And down in verse 16, you may remember the story. Esther was the queen. She had an opportunity to save the Jews from wicked Haman, remember? Remember the story? Who was plotting their destruction. She's talking with her uncle Mordecai, and, and, and she told him, I can't just enter into the king's court. It had been 30 days. I can't just go in there. It's, it's potentially a death sentence if you enter the king's court, having not been summoned by the king. But she says this, I'll go to the king. Though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. That's the attitude. That's serving no matter what it costs. John 15, 13, you're probably familiar with this text. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for, her, for his or her friends. She was willing to do that. He continues in verse 5, greet the church in their house. That's key, remember that. The, the, the church in Rome, they didn't have a building. Right? They didn't have a school to go to. Uh, they were meeting in various homes all through the city. They were really a, a bunch of separate flocks in that city. Uh, a whole lot of home Bible studies going on there. That was their pattern. He says, greet my beloved Ipinitus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. That's a pretty cool uh, tag to have, right? I was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. I'll come back to that. Greet Andronicus, Junia, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles. And they were in Christ before me. Isn't that cool? Remember Paul? It took Paul a while to be converted on that Damascus rose. They were in Christ before me. And it's thought that these, these may have been actual relatives of Paul. And he's joyous that they're in Christ. And they too had paid the price of imprisonment for their faith, sharing prison time with Paul. He continues, he greets others, verse 8. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stakies, right? Not Stuckies up there on, on you know. Stakies. Greet Apelles who is approved in Christ, greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. So back to my typical pattern of flipping quickly through names. I started chasing down this name. I stopped and started chasing down Aristobulus. And here's why I did that. Because this text says, greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. That says to me that Aristobulus did not know Christ but greet the family. It was a divided household. And I started chasing that name down, and it turns out Aristobulus was the grandson of Herod the Great from Matthew chapter 2. Remember that? Remember what Herod the Great did? Killed all those babies that were two and under because he was a nervous king. And after the wise men booked out of there and didn't come back to him, he responded 
horrible. 11. Greet my kinsmen, Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord. Trifina, Trifosa. That's a good name. That's a good, those are good pair of names, Pastor Arthur. Greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard for you in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. You know, those are some interesting uh, characters, and we don't know a lot about many of them, but it's thought they were, they were probably leaders and elders in those family, or in, in, those, in those home churches, pastoring, shepherding those groups that met in Rome. Verse 15, greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. More church branches. And then he ends the section in verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. And that was a practice. That was, that was nothing strange. Uh, embracing and kissing friends on the forehead, on the cheek, sometimes on the beard. Yeah, it was common in Old Testament, uh, customary in the early church, and it's carried on here. But I do want to circle back after getting through that laundry list uh, and, and just touch on verse 6 and 12. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. And I want to share with you uh, our, our, our commendation from Restoration Church to a Mary and Persis of our very own, which would be Jason and Michelle Simino. We had a great Thursday restoration or a uh, freeway gathering last Thursday at the Colonial Room and, and, and just thank them for their dedicated and faithful service to this ministry. It all started there. Restoration Church began there five, five years ago, starting with prayer for San, pray for Sanford. It was Arthur and just could count them on two hands, the folks that were back there doing this through COVID feeder to standing up Restoration Church. That was Pastor Arthur's heart. I, I burdened to start a church. And now adding Freeway just about a year ago to continue the ministry every Thursday for five years. Talk about working hard for you and working hard for the Lord. So I think Jason's here. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Michelle, for your faithful and dedicated service. We would not be here today had it not been for your love for the Lord, your love of the gospel, your love for the people of Sanford, and your support to the vision and mission of this church. So, thank you. And we're just changing locations. This, we're, not, we didn't, we're just going to go down the road. We're going to continue the mission. We talk about that in the Army a lot. Continue the mission. Right? We're going to go down to the 24th Street to, to, the San, uh, to the Salvation Army. So, and, we, and we're thankful that you'll be right by our side. So we love you and we, we thank you. Let's look at point two now. The commendations are done. Let's look at the caution to believers. Verse 17 and 18. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve the Lord Christ but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. You know, it makes me think about James. You know, James gives an admonition to those that are leading the churches, let not many become teachers, for they will receive a stricter judgment, it says. So these guys are, these guys are going to receive a stricter judgment. And Paul's not referring here to believers who had differences of opinion over non-essential things. This verse is talking about false teachers who teach false doctrine and create division. There's a British scholar and an author, his name's uh, Arthur Pink, and he says false prophets and teachers are to be found in the circles of even the most orthodox or traditional churches, right? They pretend to have a fervent love for souls, but they fatally delude multitudes concerning the way of salvation. That is going to be serious, strict judgment. Scary. These people are wolves in sheep's clothing. Pink goes on to say, in every church there are those that, 
who outwardly and perhaps in many other ways appear to be Christian, but they're not. Wheat and tares, it made me think about. Counterfeit saints. And, and Paul's saying, recognize them, avoid them. And verse 18 tells, tells us why. For such persons do not serve the Lord, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of uh, yeah, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So, so Paul gives two negative reasons here. First, these men are slaves to sin, and they do not serve the Lord. Second, it's their smooth talk. With their smooth talk, they deceive. Psalm 12, 2 says, They lie to one another, and they speak flattering lips and a double heart. It's interesting language here. Their, their own appetite sometimes is is called their own belly. They serve their own belly, which means selfish indulgence. They, they serve their private interest, which is contrary to sound doctrine and serving the Lord. It's a pharisaical attitude, one that seeks worldly honor, applause, riches, wealth, grandeur. They seek to please men, and they are clearly not servants of Christ. So Paul says, avoid them. He says, again, their smooth talk, their flattery deceives hearts, and their teaching is destructive. Their speech disguises itself as loving and generous, but it denies truths of the gospel. In the name of strengthening and unifying Christ's church, they, they undermine the very foundation. So we have to be discerning friends. It makes me think of prosperity gospel that's out there, right? That, that Jesus is your means to health and wealth, and you can have your best life now if you have enough faith. No, no. There are others, too. You can go down the line, legalistic gospel, liberal gospel. My family was into New Age uh, for years and years and years, so we, we just need to know what right looks like, and, and that's the sound doctrine that we follow that, that First and Timothy uh, talk about, and that's what we're all about here at Restoration Church is sound doctrine. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15 will show you what wrong looks like. False, false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Even, even Satan does that, right? Disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's not surprise, or it's no surprise if his servants disguise themselves that way also. But our defense, beloved, against this fair speech and, and false teaching. It's knowledge of and adherence to the Word of God, right? Hiding the Word in our heart. Sound doctrine that you have learned, Timothy says. And Ephesians 6 says, take up, a, take up that shield of faith so you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, right? That's our defense. And when you do that, you'll, you'll be able to spot you know, a, a false teacher in a second because you've got the truth in your heart. Matthew 7, 20 says, you will recognize them by their fruit. James says the same thing. You'll, you'll, you'll identify these people by their actions, the New Living Translation says. But again, it is our greatest desire as pastor elders here at Restoration Church that you are grounded in truth and sound doctrine. We will not waver from that. Verse 19 for your obedience is known to all. And that's point three, their compliance, right? Their obedience is known to all. So I rejoice over you, but I, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Well, Paul is closing out this chapter, and he is rejoicing over their obedience. I love that. The, the Greek word for obedience here pictures one who listens and submits to the word that is heard, right? Two pieces. Don't be a hearer only, right? We have to be, we have to be doers. It's, it's, in a, it's in clear contrast to the unsaved attitude of, of, of our rebellious and self-will. The obedience of the Romans was wonderful news to Paul. Why? Because it was an indicator 
that their faith was genuine, right? Saving faith makes us obedient to Jesus Christ. Not perfectly, but progressing. So obedience is the pattern of our life, is the idea. Striving, again, as I said, to be doers of God's word and not hearers only. Luke 6.46 says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? Right? That's the idea. So to be clear, faith that genuinely saves is the faith that results in obedience. And it's hard. I love this uh, commentary on this by John MacArthur. It should be up there. It says this, The best protection against falsehood is adhering to God's truth, just as the best protection against sin is holding on to his righteousness. Believers in Rome were protected against false teachers by their obedience to Christ and the truth of his gospel. Not only did their obedience protect themselves, but it also helped believers elsewhere who knew of and were encouraged by the Romans' church's reputation for godliness. Isn't that fantastic? That's what we want for this church. We want, it to, we want folks to say, look at Restoration Church of Sanford. They have a reputation for godliness. It's, it's so fitting. And that's exactly how he opened the book of Romans in chapter 1, verse 8. He said, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. That was their testimony. That was the testimony of the Roman church. A reputation for godliness. Here's an interesting note uh, on this. The testimony of the Roman church was so strong, this was around A.D. 49, that Emperor, Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews because of their influence, because of the influence of Crestus. Clear, undoubted references to Christ. How do we know that? Acts 18.2 tells us, and it says this, and he found a Jew, here they are, Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently came from Italy, and his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. Yeah, what a testimony. Kicked out of the city because of your, uh, your undying, passionate faith. So Paul's rejoicing for their desire to live accordingly uh, to godly wisdom. And they are living out practical, wise relationships with each other. It's the same attitude our Lord had uh, with the disciples, instructing them in Matthew 10, 16. He says, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as serpents. So that means be thoughtful, be wise, be discreet, but be innocent as doves. Now verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And it's really interesting. This is the first mention of Satan in this entire epistle. Verse 20, Paul assures faithful believers that they can look forward to the day when their spiritual warfare will be over, right? It will be complete at Christ's return. But he mentions this here because of verse 17, those who cause dissensions, they're disguising themselves as, as apostles of Christ, 2 Corinthians 11 says, but we put our hope in the God of peace, and he will have the final victory over Satan and sin. That is our hope. I mean, we know how the story ends, beloved. The Messiah will triumph. And that was prophecy that went all the way back to Genesis 3.15, right? And I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, Messiah. He, the Messiah, shall bruise your head. Some versions say crush, right? He will crush his head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So Satan's a foiled adversary. Scripture's clear. And we can confidently live in faithful obedience, relying on God's grace in our lives. His transforming power will strengthen and enable us. So friends, God's great rescue plan is complete 
in Christ. He paid it all, and he will triumph. All you need to do is call on his name if you've never done that. We learned that back in chapter 10, verse 13 of Romans, that says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now to close, let's look at 21 through 23. Paul sends additional greetings to the church at Rome on behalf of his companions. 21, Timothy, right? Timothy, I love, I love that. And we're going to dive into that in the coming months. My fellow worker greets you, and so do Lucius and Jason, and so Sopater, right? My kinsman, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, Gaius maybe? who is host to me, and to the whole church, greets you, Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus, greet you. It's interesting, Tertius was uh, Paul's admin assistant, right? His, his stenographer, if you will. It's thought at that time in Paul's life that he was going blind, and he needed that assistance in, uh, in getting this letter written. He needed that service. So he had Phoebe, the great, she had the great privilege of delivering the book, but Tertius had the privilege of actually writing this book. So, beloved, I'll just reiterate, every person can be used. You've seen it in the text. So let's put on Christ, exercise our gifts that he's given us for the fervence of his kingdom and his glory. May we continue to be bound together in our common faith and ministry for our Lord. Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for our time in the book of Romans. What a joy it has been. I have grown so much. and It's been my pleasure to be a part of this body and this study. So Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're going to continue to do in the life of Restoration Church of Sanford. We love you. We pray and give thanks in Christ's name. Amen.